happy Wednesday. Um, I just want to thank you for, for being here. Um, it's my Wednesday message, and, you know, we continue to look at some attributes of Christ uh, as we go along. And tonight we're going to look at, you know, the attribute of Christians understand the high cost of following Christ. And I don't just mean the physical cost or the monetary cost. Believers are not surprised by the cost, whatever it is, of following him. Believers are those who love God so much that any other kind of love will seem like hate to them. They love God more than even themselves. And they have, in fact, counted the cost before they come to Jesus. Jesus never promised it would be easy to be a Christian. In the world, we're going to have problems. Jesus said in John 16, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world... You're going to have tribulation. But take heart, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. The world, in fact, will hate us. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 20 to 22. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. He says, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Christians should not be surprised if the world hates you. Because in John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And now, let me clarify something. The world's not going to be hating us because we're proud or arrogant. They're not going to hate us because we call them out on sin. They're not going to hate us because we're hypocrites. But they hate us because we remind the world of Jesus. Following Jesus costs Christians everything. Remember, he said we have to be entirely surrendered to Christ, our Lord. And to illustrate this point, let's turn over to Luke 14, verses 25 to 26. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem for the last time. He knew what was coming before him. And yet great crowds followed him. They wanted to be near him for a number of reasons. Some wanted to hear more of his teachings. Some were going along for the ride. Some were curious. Some were jealous. Some were interested in being healed. Some really wanted to see a miracle. But in this passage, we'll see some of the most serious and solemn words ever spoken by Jesus. First off, Jesus defines who could not be his disciple. In verses 26 and 27 of Luke 14, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a temple, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Jesus has, was always more interested in quality, not quantity. And today, while many people want to count noses in churches, Jesus counts hearts in love with him. And Jesus says before coming after Jesus, we should count the cost. And that cost is steep. This is something that old Belshazzar of the Babylonians of Old Testament times had learned. Remember, you know, when that disconnected hand started to write on the wall to him, it said, To Cal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. He learned that God doesn't count men. He weighs them. It's something that Gideon learned when God whittled down his numbers from 32,000 to 300 because the world's value should not be a Christian's value. Likewise, Jesus only wants faithful men and women to follow him. Only those who enter his service with eyes wide open. And so he gives two illustrations of two men who fail to count the cost. And those illustrations are attributes of believers too. 
The first is a builder who starts in Luke 14, uh, verses uh, 28 and 30. He says, For which of you desiring to build a temple does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus says, If you're going to build something, in this case it's a guy building a tower, before you do anything, you plan it out. Can I cover it? Do I have enough money? And so Jesus is saying the narrow way is hard. Don't commit to it. If you love your family, your job, yourself more than God. Because you will become the object of mocking to the world. All those televangelists who ultimately would fall down in front of the world, they were mocked. If you become a Christian in the heat of a moment, a moment of conviction, because a pastor or a Christian promised you something like better health, a better wealth, a better spouse, an easier ride in life, and then it, inevitably it doesn't turn true, then you find that you've been deceived and you walk away from the faith. Isn't that really the definition of shallow earth, Christi shallow earth uh, Christians? In Matthew 13, 20 and 21, I think we covered this on Sunday, as for what was sown in the rocky soil, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and then tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As long as things are going their way, shallow earth Christians look the part. They seem like they're Christians. They live a life of a joyful Christian. And you know what? For many in the uh, Western culture today, it's easy to play the part. You're not persecuted. Without the fire of persecutions, many people have become deceived, believing that they're Christians right up to a point when the doctor says cancer or the spouse says goodbye. Maybe the boss says you're fired, at which point many lose faith. They question God and who he is. Do you even care, God? And suddenly there is no joy at church, no peace, no nothing, because they were serving the wrong God. But Jesus doesn't stop there. In verses 31 and 32 of Luke 14, Or well, what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Here's a king who knows he's going to be attacked. Again, before he goes to the war, he says, I better plan to see if I can win. And if you don't believe so, you negotiate from a distance. Please understand that in both these instances, Jesus said you need to approach it with your eyes wide open. And Jesus doesn't want any mamby-pamby posers to follow him. They're not saved, they're not Christian. They do more harm ultimately than good. You see, some Christians are afraid to suffer for Christ's sake. They're ashamed to get their hands dirty. They're too lazy to do the Christian walk. They're too stingy to support it or too unconcerned to care. Oh, while things are going easy, it's great. But as numbers get whittled down, as crises is hit, oh, then, then you see their real Christianity show through. So we have to look at these relationships Jesus wants us to have with him. We, we need a relationship. It's not a religion. It's a relationship we have with Jesus today. Look at what he says in Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Notice, it's not he should not be. He cannot be. Jesus is not saying that we should hate our relatives. Let me get that out in the open. He, you can't hate that brother or a cousin that drives you crazy. But, he says, our love for God should make all other love seem like hate. That's a lot of love. You see, God isn't just, we don't love God a little bit more than everyone else. We love him so much that everything else seems like hate. People t tend to want to love God somewhere, maybe even with, with family or friends or job. 
Oh, they say they love God more. But you know what you can look at? Look at a person's checkbook or their calendar. See how much they love God compared to other things in the world. They usually tell a different story. They show a different priority. You see, the theme of the priority of loving God over everything, Jesus repeated in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 38. Jesus warns his disciples, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have, not come, to set, I have come to set man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be from those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does love son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Look at those ver words he says. Three times he says a person's not worthy of him. If you love your parents more, you're not worthy. If you love your children more, you're not worthy. If you don't take up your cross, if you don't deny yourself, you're not worthy of Christ. And again, he's saying your love for God should eclipse all those. As believers, our priority has to be God far above all and then everything else. Jesus speaks of earth's greatest relationships, family ties, but Jesus says in light of them, I am the most important of all, and your relationship with me is more important than everything else. Further, he's saying, you must break up any earthly relationship if it's necessary to establish your relationship with me. No home, no love of your life, or earthly affection should ever come into competition with your love for Jesus. Can you say that today? All Christians must make a choice. What relationship do you prize the most? And again, I am not saying go home and tell your wife you hate her. <laughs> Wrong message. Never heard me say that. But he's saying if it's a choice between him or anything else, it always winds up being him. The choice for him may bring much earthly loss, but in return, you're going to receive a heavenly gain. Christians must recognize our responsibility to him. Look at in Matthew 10, 38. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, I've heard people say, you know, yeah, my husband, he's the cross I bear. No, that, that, that's, that's not what he's saying. He's not talking about personal troubles or frustration. He's not talking about suffering or sorrow. He's not talking about physical sickness. He's not talking about that husband of yours. It is that suffering, that reproach, that persecution of carrying the cross of Jesus. It's self-denial. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus told his disciples that if anyone would come after him, let me let after me let me do not let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me you see like moses we need to recognize what's truly valuable in hebrews 11 verses 24 to 26 the writer writes by faith moses when he was grown up refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of god than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Are you looking to your reward today, or are you looking at all the things you don't have? Are you chasing after those things? We must recognize that if we are hated for being a Christian, that's a good thing. In 1 Peter 4.14, it says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The Christian has come to Christ not to get fame, not to get wealth, but to share in Christ's shame. He must rejoice in being mocked like his Savior. And again, not because you treat others poorly, not because you're a hypocrite, but because the world sees Christ in you and so mocks you. A Christian is one who renounces the things of this world. Some of these things are the things that seem to be the way the world operates. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 too, 
but we have renounced the disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You know, when I get email from people saying, we can have church growth seminars. We can grow your church. You know what? We preach the word here at Claremont. We're not going to fiddle with God's word. We're not going to make things user-friendly. We're going to struggle in our teaching. Yes, struggling is good. We will renounce sin in all forms. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let the, him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. A Christian cannot wallow in his sin. And you can't say, well, it's not sin, this is the way God made me. You cannot say, well, I don't define it as sin, or that was a cultural thing. Sin is sin, and we have to struggle against it. We must renounce, frankly, the world. In 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow! For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. We shouldn't even look for friendship with the world. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We must take both feet out of the world, both hands off of it, and turn our eyes away from the stuff of the world. We must renounce our own Righteousness. You know what? I'm a sinner. I can't do anything right on my own. Every claim, every uh, credit that we claim, we have to renounce it all. If you get something from these messages, it's not because of Bill McVicker. It's because of Jesus Christ. We are and have nothing. As the, Rock of Ages, the song Rock of Ages says, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. The renouncing of the world, the flesh, the devil, and anything else, even ourselves, to meet God's requirement is an imperative of a Christian. So in conclusion, it costs a lot to be a Christian. It costs a lot more eternally not to be a Christian. And you get so much more return if you live a life of victory in Jesus Christ. Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. So today, a Christian is one who's counted the cost. And like the men in Matthew 13, verses 44 to 4, 46 found recognized the greater treasure he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field again Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it you see Eternal life is worth more than the finite things of this world. These men recognize the great value of the kingdom, and so everything else seems like so much garbage. Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, he said, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by 
any means possible, I may obtain the, the resurrection from the dead. So today, what do you value more? And if you say Jesus and you say, well, I follow him wholeheartedly, will your checkbook and calendar bear witness to that fact? Will your spouse or will your friends? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for who you are. Lord, open our eyes to the things that possess us. I think of that rich young ruler, Lord, who, who came to Jesus and thought he was in a great place. He obeyed all the rules, all the laws, and Lord, when Jesus asked him to get rid of the things that possessed him, he went away grieving. Lord, open our eyes to where our priorities are, and Lord, let us recognize the value of you more than ever. In your name, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you on Sunday.